the bell is rung three times as a call to worship in honor of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The call to worship and confession and forgiveness tonight is based on Psalm 15, and it's found in your bulletin. Please stand as you are able. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? And speak the truth in their heart. Those who have no slander in the gospel, who do their neighbor. Lord, who may live on your holy hill? Those who do these things will never be shaken. O Lord, we repent our sins, and mourn the sins of this world with our whole hearts and souls. Do you believe that sin is forgiven not by your own merits, but through Jesus Christ? We believe that we are forgiven and justified by God's grace, faith, and faith. Hear then the good news. You have been washed in the innocent blood of the Lamb of God. By the suffering of Jesus Christ and for his sake, your sins are entirely forgiven you. Dwell in his sanctuary and with your whole heart and soul, worship the Lord your God on his holy hill. Amen. You may be seated. Deuteronomy. Uh, the entire book of Deuteronomy um, is Moses' farewell address to the people of Israel. Moses had been with them for 40 years in the wilderness. They were about to enter the promised land, but Moses knew that his time on earth would grow short, that the Lord was going to take him, for the Lord told him he was not going to enter in with the people. So the people were sad. The people were sad, and these words are part of Moses' words of comfort to the Israelite people, that God had been with them all this time. God was not going to abandon them now. And again, this comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. To God. Psalm 111 is our psalm this week. Um, 
I did a reflection on this on the, for Thursday morning or Thursday morning psalm, so it's online already if you care to listen to it. It is a wonderful psalm of praise to the Lord. Basically, you, one of the commentators I read said, the Lord God wants you to know him. If you were going to introduce yourself to somebody else, you would give a whole history and background of yourself to the person so that they would know you. Psalm 111 is giving a history and background of the Lord God to people. So this could be an introduction to the Lord for people. We will read it responsibly. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all of you who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with the faithfulness of the recklessness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. His praise does endure forever, and he did send redemption to his people. I think that's the most important verse in it, that he has sent redemption to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And we remember that redemption every time we celebrate Holy Communion. The second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. St. Paul writes, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anybody imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be many so-called gods in heaven and on earth, and gods with a little g, as indeed there are many little g gods and many little l lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom all things we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anybody sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, this brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would ask you to stand as you are able to hear the words of the Holy Gospel tonight, which comes to us from the first chapter of Mark, starting at the 21st verse. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent. And come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. 
so that they question among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, Jesus' fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The gospel of our Lord. Praise you may be seated, and I may take off this mask. There is much to explain tonight, and I was asked to do just that. I was asked to explain. I was asked to teach and preach tonight. Preaching is saying Christ died for the forgiveness of our sins and that we have life everlasting because of that. That is preaching, preaching Christ. But I was also asked to explain a little bit more about the Gospel of Mark. So let us pray. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. Oh, boy. My dear friends, 2021, this year, we are going to be spending reading the Gospel of Mark. This is year B in the lectionary cycle. Year B just simply means it's Mark's turn. We're going to hear from Mark's Gospel all year. Year A is Matthew, year B is Mark, year C is Luke. We are in year B. So if we're going to hear so much from Mark this year, there are things you should know about Mark and things you should know about Mark's Gospel. We know that in the book of Acts that Luke wrote, we know that Mark was a traveling companion of St. Paul's on his first missionary journey. But Mark and St. Paul had a falling out. Mark abandoned the trip halfway through. Paul was not happy. I will tell you, though, that they later reconciled to one another, which is good news. And then later on, Mark became a traveling companion of St. Peter. We know this because Peter told him in us himself in the epistle, the epistle of 1 Peter chapter 5. Boy, imagine hanging out with those people, huh? You get to hang out with St. Paul and St. Peter. Wow, that's what Mark did. Now, according to church tradition, St. Peter did visit Rome, and Mark was with him in Rome. And it is traditionally thought that in Rome, Mark transcribed Peter's stories about Christ, and that that became the, gospel, the basis of, of Mark's gospel. So many of the commentators think that this gospel of Mark is Peter's, that it came to us through Mark, but it was Peter's words and so forth. It really doesn't matter, it's still the gospel. Mark's, Mark's words were, are beautiful. And whether it was handed down to him from Peter or not, it's still a beautiful gospel. It was also the first gospel that was written. It was written sometime in the mid-50s to mid-60s of the first century. And as I said, the gospel of Mark was thought to have been written in Rome based on Peter's teaching in Rome and was written for the community of believers in Rome. Now, some of the things that are very distinctive about Mark's writing style is it's very urgent. It's the shortest of the gospel. It's only 16 chapter. Mark is just the facts and the facts only. And it is an action-packed gospel. The grace of God comes to us in Jesus' words and his actions. We will hear the words immediately and at once throughout the gospel. In fact, in the first chapter alone, the word immediately and at once is used nine times. Mark's gospel <clears throat> Mark had a purpose for writing his gospel. The first people to enjoy the benefit of Mark's gospel were the people at Rome, but he wrote it for us too. He wrote it for the audience in Rome, but he wrote it for us too some 2,000 years later. And the reason he wrote it is because he wants you to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Mark's faith, Mark's faith in Christ just comes through overflowing in this gospel and what he's trying to do is awaken your faith he wants to either awaken your faith or deepen your faith in Christ that's why Mark is sharing his faith chapter 1 verse 1 reads the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God he puts it out right up front that Jesus is the Son of God and this book is all good news Mark wants us to know that Christ is the Son of God 
And it's written first and foremost. Right in the first sentence, he puts it out there. Jesus is the Son of God. It's right in front. Mark also wants us to know that this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus. He didn't mean for it to be the all in all, the all encompassing. It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we still have good news of Jesus Christ for us today. Jesus' coming to this world brings the kingdom of God to this world. And Mark's gospel is written so that you believe. It's a call to discipleship. And how Mark describes discipleship is simply believing in Christ as the Son of God. It's to have a faithful relationship with the Lord. So the gospel tonight comes from the first chapter. Verse 21 it starts. But he, listen to all that happened before this verse. Mark packed a lot of action into the first 20 verses. We first heard that John the Baptist was in the desert. That Jesus was baptized by John. That Jesus' temptation in the wilderness began. And that Jesus began to call disciples. All that in 20 verses. And now Jesus and four of the apostles... Andrew, his brother Simon, who would later be called Peter, James and John, along with Jesus, go into Capernaum. That's where they're going to put, their, that's where their base of operations is going to be. And Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And it might sound strange to us that he goes to a new town and immediately begins teaching in their synagogue, their place of worship. But you need to know that in those days, a synagogue didn't have like a full-time preacher. They had an administrator. And one of the duties of the synagogue administrator was to line up speakers. And anyone who was qualified could speak in a synagogue. And a synagogue service in those days would include prayers, it would include scripture readings, and then teachings. Anyone could teach. There were no such things as ordained rabbis at that time. More than likely, it would be a scribe who would be among those who would teach on the Sabbath. The scribe was like a theological lawyer, if you will. And I'll explain more about scribes in just a second. So Jesus is teaching. He was invited to teach. And this, these verses, these seven verses, these are actually a miracle story. This is Jesus' first miracle that he does with his apostles in Mark's gospel. It's very early on. He, he was just baptized, he was just in the wilderness, he just started to call his disciples and now he's teaching in the synagogue. It's almost like the beginning of his public ministry, his outreach to people. So this is actually a miracle story. It's a story about authority. Who has it and who doesn't? And authority is a major theme throughout the gospel of Mark. Now, as Jesus is teaching, we're not told what he's teaching. We're not told what he said. But what we are told is that he was interrupted by a man that was possessed with an unclean spirit, a demonic spirit. And some of the commentators said this man was totally, totally under control by this demonic spirit. This man who was possessed should not have been in the synagogue. Because he was possessed, he would have been considered unclean. He would not have been allowed inside a place of worship. But there he was. Jesus was there, and there was a person who was in dire need of being healed. Jesus. Jesus saw a person in need and reached out to meet the need. The demonic spirit knows who Jesus is and says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? And at this point in Mark's gospel, this demonic possessed man is the only one who knows who Jesus really is. Even the disciples don't know. So the question is, have you come to destroy us? The short term answer and the long term answer is yes. Yes. With Jesus' arrival on the scene, as Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven to earth, he also brings it with it all authority on heaven and earth, which has been given to him. And so it could only mean one thing for the demonics. Their authority was disappearing. Their time has grown short. Satan's power and authority are officially in decline now. 
because Jesus has arrived? So the answer is yes. Jesus did come to destroy them. In seven words, in seven words only, Jesus commands the unclean spirit to be silent and come out of him. Word and action. Be silent, come out of him. And the spirit, the demonic, has no choice. The demonic has to obey the Holy One of God because Jesus is the one with authority. And no wonder the people were so amazed. They had never heard teaching like this before. I told you, the scribes usually were the ones who taught. But the scribes taught a little bit differently. Scribes interpreted the law, so they might read scripture and tell you what it means. They might also say, this is what it allows and this is what it doesn't allow. They usually quoted other people. They never talked in their own words, so to speak. They never, they never did that. They always quoted somebody else. So this was by Jesus coming and saying, be, be still and come out of him. Very different, very different. Christ taught by his words and was his action. And just think about it. This unclean man, this unclean spirit in possession of a man. How horrible that must have been. This man was bound by Satan completely, and Jesus sets him free. Think of it. Capernaum wasn't that big of a town. This person who was possessed was their neighbor. This person who was possessed was a child of God, just like they were. And this neighbor of theirs, this person who was totally possessed, is released and set free from bondage right in front of them. And the people are amazed. Mark then tells us that word got out. The fame of Jesus spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region. Later that day, after the synagogue service, they would go to Peter's house. Because Peter lived in Capernaum. And Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus would heal Peter's mother-in-law. And later that night, because word got out around Jesus and his healings, his miraculous healings, the people in the surrounding region would bring to Jesus that night all that who were possessed and all who were sick, and it says Jesus healed them all. What a day Jesus had. What a start to his ministry. So Mark writes this gospel so you will believe. Mark's telling us it's urgent that you believe because your salvation is always urgent. Mark wants you to have a relationship with Christ. So in the rest of the gospel, Mark will go on to describe or to show Jesus as a teacher, as a healer, that Jesus is the one with authority, that he was the son of David, that he is the son of man and son of God. And Mark will also call him the suffering servant, which is a reference to the Jewish faithful to the prophet Isaiah, who described the suffering servant in his, 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 his uh, prophetic writings. Okay. I said our gospel story tonight was a, a miracle of authority. As the Son of God, Jesus has the authority. Jesus always had this authority from the very beginning, from creation and before creation. And Jesus still has authority in our lives today, and he will for all time. As I said, one of the themes of Mark's gospel is this authority that Jesus has. And the question of authority in Mark's gospel will be the reason Jesus will be put to death. The religious authorities, the chief priests, the Pharisees, though not all Pharisees, and the scribes will all reject Jesus' authority and they will put him to death on a cross. Mark begins by saying his writing is the beginning of good news. The good news of Christ for us is that this teacher, this healer, this miracle worker, this son of God is the suffering servant foretold by Isaiah. And Jesus will suffer death on a cross death by going to a cross, dying for the forgiveness of our sins because he loves us so much. And he will rise again on the third day. And in rising from the dead, Jesus conquers death once and for all, for all of us, even 2,000 years later. Mark wants you to believe. And we have Jesus' promise of life everlasting with him. Wow, is that good news. So, if the people in the synagogue were amazed, are you amazed at this good news? We should all be amazed because Jesus brings us salvation. I can't wait to talk about the Gospel of Mark all year this year. 
I hope you want to hear more too. This is just the beginning. May God bless you all and thanks be to God. Let us all be amazed to the promise of salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. But I'm not done yet. That would have been a great place to stop, right, Scott? <laughs> right? But I'm gonna skip over, I'm just gonna keep going because I wanna tell you a postscript. Because some people say, think, you know, nobody's amazed at church anymore. We come every week, we sit in the pews, we hear the same stuff over and over again. It doesn't get amazing anymore. So I wanna tell you about a children's sermon I did at the Lutheran Church of Our Redeemer in Foxborough, Massachusetts. That's the Lutheran Church in the shadows of the football stadium there. I did a children's sermon. I don't remember anything I said. All I remember is after the children's sermon, we had gathered in the front, right? We all sat down and talked. There, were, there was a set of triplets in that congregation. Five-year-old girls, there were three of them, they were like little copies of each other sitting there. And in case you think being amazed doesn't happen in church anymore, after hearing the children's sermon in church that Sunday morning, one of these triplets, I don't remember which one is which, I couldn't tell them apart, but this five-year-old girl was wide-eyed with amazement because she had discovered something. She then, and the church was so quiet, after, the, after that, because the real sermon was about to come. The adult sermon was about to come. But here, this five-year-old girl runs down the center aisle, shouting out, Mom! Mom! Jesus is God's son! <laughs> she didn't know that. She found out at the children's sermon. She was amazed. And also was the whole rest of the congregation. That was wonderful. What a beautiful way to be amazed at church. She was amazed that Jesus was God's son and she couldn't wait to share it with her mom. The faith of a child. The child's faith, that too is amazing. Amen. I'll stop now. <laughs>
January is bad enough with isolation. The pandemic makes it worse. Heal us, O Lord, by your grace. Keep us connected to one another. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the outreach ministries of this church. First, so that all may be fed, so that no one goes hungry. We pray for all food pantries and soup kitchens, so that a once and for all cure for cancer may be found. We pray for Relay for Life and all cancer research, so that God's comfort may be found and shared in times of crisis. We pray for the quilting ministry and for Lutheran world hunger and Lutheran world disaster relief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord God of hosts, be with us and bring your healing touch to those who are sick and suffering. We pray for those serving in the military far from home, especially Derek, Richard, Charlie, Peyton, Manny, Anna, John, David, Nate, Jacob, Michael, Anthony, and Tina. We pray for our homebound members, Shelly, Norma, and Janet. We pray for those who are sick and suffering for whatever reason. We pray first tonight for Aiden. Uh, Aiden is Kathy Thompson's grandson who apparently broke his arm this Oops. afternoon and is having it set at Connemore Hospital now. We also pray for Barbara Wallet, for Russ Saliga, for Bill, for Ann Catherine, for Jim and Jeannie, for Gwen, Debbie, Ken, Caitlin, for Tim, for McKenna, for Bob, for Linda, for Joan, for Linda, for John, for Jane, for Kate, for Jan, for Regina, for Sandy, for Brody, for Rich McCullough, for Nancy, for Ivy, for Mary Lou, for Jean, for Katie, for Chase, for Christoph, Donovan, Will, John, for Vern, and for Charles Ross, and all those we name in our hearts and on our lips. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for our church council. We pray for all pastors. We pray for church musicians and all who serve the church in any capacity. We pray for our current Bishop Michael and for the future bishop to be elected this June. And we pray for this church, that we would always be faithful and seek God's will in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Blessed be God forever. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your steadfast love and mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with setting the table and getting the gloves on. Just want to remind you that the uh, in the Eucharistic prayer, we stand for the Eucharistic prayer when, and we usually start to stand when I say lift up your hearts. So we will do that. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me.
and gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. You may be seated. And as I distribute the communion sets to you, this is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. So as soon as you get it, please feel free to do so. Please stand as you're able. And may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a couple of announcements. There is a virtual church council meeting on Monday evening at 7. Okay. Uh, Scott will send out the, uh, the information for us all to connect online. Uh, we do have a major snowstorm coming, um, but thanks to our crack weather team, uh, we realized that the snow, uh, the snow won't be starting to accumulate until after we're finished with church in the morning. So we will have church tomorrow morning um, for those who want to come. That'll be good. That'll be good. I'm pretty sure that quilting is going to be canceled for one day. Are there any other announcements for the good of our church? Ash Wednesday is coming up soon. Uh, February 17th is Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Our plan right now, and I'm going to discuss it with the council tomorrow night, is that we will have Ash Wednesday services. We'll have it at noon and 7 p.m. like we always do, but we will have non-contact distribution of ashes um, through disposable, single-use Q-tips, which I will dip in oil and then the ashes and then onto the forehead and then into the holy trash can. Okay, so. Uh, Ash Wednesday is coming up. Lent is coming up. Next week, I'm going to put out devotionals for Lent. We will not have a Wednesday evening Lenten service this year, but there'll be devotionals for people to use at home. The only Wednesday evening service will be on Ash Wednesday itself. Are there any other announcements? If not, please stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.